What's up guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we have an exclusive number one uh, first edition prototype model, the 2021 Terra Oasis by Intec. As always, starting right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure, this camper is going to ride on a 2 and 5 16 ball, so let's make sure our tow vehicle is outfitted with that. We're going to start with our slide latch in the unlocked position. We're going to then position our jack and coupler about three inches above our ball. Once we are centered underneath the coupler, we of course lower that jack back down, uh, making full contact with the ball. Once fully seated, we go ahead and slide our latch lock forward. We're going to pay special attention that our tabs here are recessed there into the frame, uh, making full contact. Not a bad idea to go back and pin this with the secondary uh, security pin. Once secured there on the ball, we're going to take our tow chains, make sure they're crossed underneath the coupler since that is state law in Texas. Also, we're going to make sure that we have enough room to make our turns left to right, but not so much room that these may make contact with the pavement. Riding right along with those tow chains is going to be our emergency breakaway cable. Very important safety function. Uh, this is going to uh, allow you to, to break the vehicle if your other tow components were to become compromised. Uh, this is like a ripcord to the electric brakes as the two vehicles were to separate. This is going to, of course, put full 12 volts to that braking system. So the idea being is that you're going to have a third connection point on the receiver, whether that's a carabiner, quick link, any way to attach this separately to your receiver of the tow chains. And lastly, up front here, we have our seven-way receptacle. Now, this is going to plug into the bumper port on your vehicle. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's charging system, braking system, marker lights, tail lights, things like that. Hopping up here to your electric tongue jack so we can talk about that further. Uh, of course, we have a light that's going to give you a point of reference if you're backing up to the unit at dark. Also going to help light this if, again, you are doing any work here after dark. And then we have extend and retract labeled there on that momentary switch. Now, in the event of a power loss situation, you still have the ability to manually operate this jack. As you can see, you have a large uh, rubber plug there. Idea being is that you would go ahead and remove that plug. It's going to be a three-quarter inch drive nut that we find underneath there. And your stabilizer jack crank handle will double as your manual jack crank handle as well. Hopping on back here, we have this uh, propane cover held on by two cotter pins on both sides. If we go ahead and remove those, get that out of the way, we're gonna go ahead and see our two 20 pound propane cylinders. These will be full for you at time of delivery. Uh, same variant you're going to find on any gas grill and is easily exchangeable at any filling station. We have open and closed valves on the top of each tank, pigtail leading into our regulator. Now, when it does come to remove these tanks for service, uh, of course, go ahead and turn that valve into the off position, disconnect your pigtail off of the cylinder, and then you'll find an oversized wing nut here in between the tanks. You just go ahead and remove that. That regulator will go ahead and slump out of the way, rotate that T-bar, and then they'll both easily be removed for service. One more thing before we move on, let's go ahead and talk about the operation of your propane regulator. Uh, you can see that this is directionalized towards either tank. So the one that it's pointing in is going to be your primary tank with the other one being the secondary. The idea being is that it is going to automatically switch in between tanks if you run out of gas here on your propane tank. It's gonna go automatically switch over here to your secondary tank. Now, if in the interim you wanna go ahead and take your primary tank to be filled, all we have to do at that point is go ahead and switch this over to our secondary tank until we return our primary tank back to service. And then you can, you know, switch it back and forth however you're inclined to do. On the Terra Oasis, as well as quite a bit of other of Intex models, you have this beautiful front window, a uh, very large pane of glass. Now we have the protective cover over that window. That's of course designed to protect that while going down the road from rock trips, rock chips, road debris, things like that. So, this cover is very easily installed. You're going to see a rail that runs the top of the window. You're gonna go ahead and, and work that on first. Now, someone of my height uh, may need a step stool. Someone a little taller could probably uh, work their way up there. But once that is all the way slid across and uh, the snaps are lined up at the top, again, if you're using a step stool, you might as well just go ahead and snap the two top snaps. Uh, if you can reach them without a step stool, more power to you. And then from there, we just work our way around. 
Uh, these are very standard kind of snaps, so I find most people are familiar with these. They're not the security snaps or anything that they've used in the past. So just a slight amount of pressure is going to go ahead and secure that. On all four corners of the unit here, we have stabilizer jacks. Now these are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. The idea being is that you will level the camper front to back using the main tongue jack, left to right using the tires and a leveling kit. And once you are satisfied with your level, you'll then run these stabilizer jacks down. Uh, they're not meant to be load bearing, they are just to stabilize the floor. So a uh, three quarter inch crank handle here. And we're going to of course put that on the drive nut on the end of the jack. We're gonna come down, we're gonna make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Same on the way up, no need to go overly tight in either direction. We are just trying to, again, stabilize the floor. So moving on a little bit, we have our six gallon capacity dual source water heater. Uh, what that means for you is this is not only going to run on 110 volt electricity when you are in the capacity of an RV park, but it will also run on 12, or excuse me, run on propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. So a uh, manufacturer has uh, some very specific recommendations on how to maintain this thing, how to drain it, things like that. So uh, when we are going to uh, return the unit back to service, the, it's important that we do not leave water in the unit overall for more than seven days, but specifically within the water heater as well. So. Uh, number one, make sure that you have given it time to cool down. You don't want to hurt yourself when trying to uh, drain it. So generally eight hours or so is enough for that to cool down. Once you're confident of the temperature, it's very important that we depressurize the holding tank of the hot water heater. So what you do is you uh, cut the overall inflow of water to the unit. So if we're running off the 12 volt water pump, that's as easy as flipping a switch. If we're hooked up to city water connection, easy, as easy as turning the water off at the valve. So once no new water is flowing into the camper overall, we're going to go to the nearest uh, water source that has both hot and cold water. We're gonna focus on the hot side of the plumbing. We're gonna open that up. You may see a little uh, steam, maybe a little bit of water. What we're actually doing is, is depressurizing the water heater itself. So once we've done that, we're free to continue draining it. What you're then gonna do is you're gonna walk back out here. You're gonna grab yourself an inch and a 16th socket and extension generally to go ahead and get here on the drain plug. We're gonna go ahead and back that drain plug and the remaining five and a half, six gallons of water will be evacuated from this location here. Now on the flip side of that conversation, when, when we want to go ahead and take the unit back out of storage, uh, before we actually start heating water, we have to prime that water heater or fill it with six gallons of water. So a uh, very similar process to draining it. We're uh, again going to be using that hot side of the spigot to do so. So starting out, we're going to hook up water to the unit overall. We have to have water flowing into the unit, of course, to fill this tank. So once we've done that, we're going to again go to the hot side of that spigot. Go ahead and turn that on. Now what we're gonna see here is a little bit different than what we saw when we were trying to depressurize it. We're gonna see a lot more water, but we're also gonna see a lot more air as well. What's happening, what's happening is it is displacing the air that has filled the tank and replacing it with water. So once that flow normalizes at that fixture, that's generally your good indicator that you do have six gallons of water into this tank and we can go ahead and start heating that. Now when you are choosing your source or choosing how you heat that water, that's going to be located on the inside. You're going to do all of that at the inside. You can use both sources, electricity and propane. That's going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, or you can use those as they present themselves. So either or. Uh, now, one thing to mention as well is, is your drain plug here kind of pulls double duty. It's, of course, your drain plug. We've talked about it in that capacity. But it's also an anode rod. Now, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that anode rod, eat away at that as opposed to the inside of your water heater. It is a consumable part. Generally, we, get to, we see our customers get a season or two of camping before it's time to replace this anode rod. Starts out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. By the time it's, when it's time to replace, it's about the size of a pencil and looks very decrepit. Now, when you go to replace this, go ahead and keep your old drain plug and an anode rod Take that into the RV dealer so they can size you up and match your threads and size and things like that. Moving on a little further back from the water heater, 
but on the same lines as talking about draining the unit of the water for storage, we're gonna find our low point drains here. Now these are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. We're gonna use these two valves here to drain everything in between water source and fixture. So the idea being is that if you've taken the unit out, you've used it, uh, you're going to drain the freshwater holding tank. We're going to find that underneath the bed on the inside. We're going to find that valve. We'll get your eyes on that. Once we have drained that freshwater holding tank, we're going to come outside. We're going to open up these low point drains. Again, that's going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up with the water heater uh, following that same process that we just talked about. Once you've done all three of those things, the unit is ready for storage. And also, if you're planning on winterizing it, that's going to be kind of your first step is making sure that there is no water within the unit. Now, moving on here a little bit further, we have our furnace vent. Now, this is an exhaust vent. Most important of this appliance is to let it exhaust. We're not going to want to restrict that flow or put anything over that. Uh, one thing to also mention, a problem that we have here in Texas is going to be mud daubers and flying insects nesting within our propane appliances. So what we generally will recommend is uh, utilizing a store-bought screen to go ahead and keep those mud daubers and flying insects out. Uh, that not only goes here for the furnace, but that goes for all of our propane appliances as well. Next up is going to be our 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. This is your cord, comes with the unit. Generally, it's between 25 and 30 feet. Now, if we go ahead and look here at the end, we're gonna see two slanted receptacles, one L-shaped, and then we have the matching prongs there on the camper. Idea being is that we just line everything up. We're gonna go ahead and plug straight in. We give it an eighth inch turn to the right. That locks that plug on. And then we have a secondary collar here that we can screw down to secure that connection further. That's gonna keep everything nice and tightly connected. Um, one recommendation that I generally will recommend for every unit that I deliver is going to be the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. So a ton of things going on within this camper electronically, and it's very important that we protect those from natural surges, substandard wiring, uh, dirty power, things like that. The only way to effectively do that is going to be with a 30 amp surge protector. So if you have any questions on the products that we recommend or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to educate you on adding a surge protector to your unit. Now, one other thing to mention about that is with your purchase, we include a 30 to 15 amp reducer. Now, this becomes helpful for you if you want to, you know, check the function of lights or pre-cool the refrigerator, things like that. Uh, you can do very easily with this reducer in your garage at home. Now, if you're going to be doing some, you know, if you're camping in a campsite that has only 15 amp service for whatever reason, or you want to like run the air conditioner for an extended period of time, this is not going to be the style of reducer that you would use. So what you're going to use is a dog bone style reducer. Of course, it accomplishes the same thing, although it separates the cord ends by about 12 inches worth of cord. So it dissipates heat a whole lot better. It's going to work a lot better for you if you go ahead and use that. Right next to that power supply, we have our cable satellite inlet. This is just a standard RG6 cable fitting that will allow you to feed PV services to the unit, whether that be a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package. This is going to be your entry point. Generally, those will trans, uh, excuse me, generally those will terminate at the designated PV areas of the camper. And then right beside that, we have a solar port here. This is designed specifically for a portable solar panel. The idea being is that you could park your unit in the shade. We can make, utilize this plug and play connection to make our connection and then take our panel out into the sun. With most, sol with most, por most portable solar panels, the charge controller is built directly into the panel and that's going to kind of be the brains behind the operation. That's going to make sure those batteries or that battery on the inside is not being overcharged. So, uh, it's nice to have this down low here in case you do want to take advantage of that portable solar. Next up to talk about is going to be tire pressure and lug nuts. Extremely important thing when we, uh, not only with this camper, but with any camper, any trailer, uh, it's exceptionally important. So with any trailer tire, you run them at the max tire pressure rating. Uh, that's going to give you the highest flexibility in terms of weight. So whether you are completely full or completely empty, that 50 PSI is going to be a good number. So uh, you'll find that stamped into the sidewall of the tire in the more traditional locations. 
You will also find that on the frame up front of the unit, giving you the tire pressure and axle rating. Also, lug nut torque is very important. These have been torqued down here in our shop to 100 foot-pounds. Every manufacturer has a retorque procedure. We can see that outlined here on this sticker. What that says for you is that you are going to retorque these lugs on the initial 10, 25, and 50 miles of initial driving. So stop, pull over. You're going to use a torque wrench. Make sure that they are maintaining 100 foot-pounds of torque. Next up is a process that everybody enjoys, and that is dumping your wastewater from the unit. So uh, you have, as well as most units, a gray and a black water holding tank within this unit. The handles are labeled here on the body, and sewage holding tank is, of course, going to be body waste, solid waste, things like that. And then our wastewater is going to be sink water, shower water, relatively to uh, the relatively cleaner of the two. Very important that we keep these valves in the closed position. We're going to use the onboard monitor panel to check the levels. Uh, and it's very important that we only dump as necessary. Specifically with this black water tank, as kind of gross as it is to talk about, we want to keep that body waste and that toilet paper in as wet or flowing condition as we can so that when we do go to dump it, it evacuates that tank as easily as possible. So uh, with these valves in the closed position, it's also worth mentioning that they should never be opened at the same time. We want to avoid any cross-contamination or backfeeding issues. Generally, the popular option is going to be dumping the black water first. Once we are satisfied with that or we're sure that we've gotten all of that waste out, we're going to go ahead and close that valve. We're then going to open up our gray water. What that's going to do is rinse any shared plumbing as well as our sewage hose on the way out. Now, moving over a little bit, we have our bayonet fitting. That's where we're actually going to connect our sewage hose. And that sewage hose is going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. So if I go ahead and remove this cap, which sometimes when they're new, they can be stuck on there pretty tough. Once we've done so, we're going to go ahead and we can inspect here around the tube. We see four prongs, a little bit of water that has snuck behind the valve, which is normal as well. We're going to line these keyholes up in that halfway position. We're going to give it a quarter turn that's going to lock it on. Now, if we go ahead and look at our sewage hose here, that has the very same keyholes as well. And uh, the connection method is going to be exactly the same. Next up, we're going to talk about adding water into the unit. So a couple of options, of course, generally, we will uh, separate this in between what we're gonna be using and the capacity of an RV park and what we would be using if we were taking the unit off grid boondocking. So first up is going to be the boondocking option. That's going to be filling that onboard water, uh, excuse me, onboard holding tank. Uh, to do that, we're going to take a drinking water hose. We're going to insert it right into the orifice. We're going to fill it up till we are satisfied. Once we've done so, we cap it off. Keep in mind that this is not naturally pressurized, so we do need to use the onboard 12-volt water pump to pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures to make it usable. We're going to, again, get your eyes on that water pump switch so you know where it's at. But again, this is going to be your boondocking or off-grid option. Right beside that, we have what they call the, the city water connection. That's going to be what we use, again, in the capacity of an RV park. It is important to note that water pressure becomes very important when we are hooking city water up to the unit. Generally, these units are rated for a water pressure rating of uh, excuse me, 50 to 75 PSI. Uh, it's very important, again, that we do not exceed those uh, limitations. So. Uh, Included with your purchase, you're going to find a water pressure regulator. This is, of course, going to regulate that pressure well within those specs. The idea being is that we take our water pressure regulator, we hook that directly onto the water source, we then screw our hose, excuse me, screw our hose directly onto that water pressure reg regulator, and then we make our trailer connection here by actually rotating this connection point here on the camper. Uh, if if, excuse me, if you do lose this water pressure regulator, it gets damaged, something happens to it, please, please, please do yourself a favor and do not operate the unit for any amount of time without regulating that water pressure. Uh, dropping down below, we have our Quick Connect spray port here. Uh, everything does store, the hose, I should say, stores into this compartment, so it's nice that it's all self-contained. Now, what you're gonna do is you will have a locking collar here if you slide that locking collar back, that's going to allow you to insert the mail in fully 
Once you are fully inserted, it will click back into lock into position. And then once you've done so, that hose automatically pressurizes and you have that access to water. Now, with that being said, when it comes to disconnect that hose, if there's still pressure in this hose, it can be difficult to actually disconnect it here. So generally what we recommend is go ahead and cut the overall inflow of water to the unit. Go ahead and crack open your valve here. Let that pressure bleed out from the hose. That's going to make connect, uh, disconnecting it here a lot more easier. And that process is, is, of course, just the opposite of connecting it. Slide that locking collar into the back position, and that's going to just go ahead and spit right out of there. You may be asking yourself, where am I going to keep my sewage hose when not in use? Of course, you do not want to put it here in your compartment with all your other stuff. Uh, Intech has thought of that. They have included a under compartment sewage hose storage here. And of course, you go ahead and take your sewage hose. And of course, I got air in the bag, so it's not going to fit all the way in there. But once you've done so, it does have a little latch here on the side of it that's going to keep that nice and secure uh, while traveling. Main storage compartment here, a ton of room in there. Although for us, in our presentation, there is not too terribly much for us to speak of. You do have a 12 volt socket back there, as well as a uh, couple 15 amp outlets. It's just speculation on my part, but I do believe that possibly in the future they may offer, or, or maybe they do and I don't know, the ability to hook up the 12 volt uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the Dometic uh, refrigerators in there. So I think that that's probably what they're thinking. They've done that in previous models. Uh, who knows? Transitioning here to the rear of the unit, not too terribly much that we need to speak of. Of course, you have your uh, marker lights, tail lights, license plate lights, all traditional stuff. One thing Intec has done for you is they have pre-wired the unit for a backup camera. They have made it exceptionally easy to go ahead and add that for you at any time. Now, generally how those backup cameras work is they're actually tying into the marker lights. What that does is anytime you are running with your lights on, they are going to give you a full-time rear view. So very easy to add, something that we could do for you at the time of delivery or certainly something you could do yourself if you are inclined to do so. Also here at the rear, we have a small receiver. Uh, idea being is you can go ahead and put a bike rack, maybe a cargo rack back here. Now this does have some weight limitations. We're gonna make sure that we do not exceed a hundred pounds of cargo here on the receiver. So whether you're adding a bike rack or a cargo rack, uh, excellent feature to have, just making sure that you are not exceeding that weight limit. All right, guys, here we are on the door side of the unit. Uh, we can see the other side of that pass-through compartment, of course. But if we look directly below that, we have a quick connect propane gas line. Uh, what this allows you to do is make a connection here at the rear of the unit, tap into our two 20-pound propane cylinders, and run just about any gas appliance that, that fits within the specs of that propane regulator. So. Uh, generally, that can be a gas grill, propane fire pit, propane heater, any of those, as long as they utilize that quick connect fitting, uh, can go ahead and uh, connect onto this. Now, same with the outside sprayer, you're going to slide the locking collar back, insert the male end fully. Once you've done so, that's going to go ahead and snap back. Uh, slightly different is you're going to find a valve here uh, behind that spring clamp. And what you do is you go ahead and put that uh, in the width flow and that's gonna open up that valve and provide propane to your appliance. Now, once you're done using, going down the road, important that we do go ahead and replace that dust cover, keep any road debris, anything like that from uh, depositing into the fitting. And then we have a couple 15 amp outlets here. Of course, nothing too crazy, just some all weather outlets. Let you go ahead and plug in the boom box or any you know outdoor equipment that you may wanna be uh, enjoying while, uh, or excuse me, Plug any outdoor equipment that you may want to be powering while enjoying this space. And then a little further up, we got another set of outlets. So uh, feel free to light this space up like a Christmas tree because you have a ton of outlets here. Uh, plug in what you'd like. It's going to make things very uh, enjoyable and usable. Uh, entry steps, very traditional style entry steps. Uh, the last step will fold over the first step and then everything is just going to slide right in there like so. Going to lock in one into that uh, stowed position. And then when you want to pull them out, you just, same thing in reverse. And then we have a, another storage compartment right up front here. 
Uh, again, nothing too crazy to speak of. I guess we haven't noted it yet, but you're going to have magnetic hold open on all of these cabinets, or excuse me, on all of these compartment doors, uh, which makes loading and unloading a breeze. That just about covers it here on the exterior of the Oasis. We're going to hop on the inside and take a look at those appliances and features. All right, guys, here as we make our way into the interior of the unit, I do just want to point out one more time that this is prototype number one. So some things that you're going to see on the inside of this unit are not where they were located in the production model. I'll do my best to kind of point that out as we go. Uh, but starting right up front here into the door, we have our uh, head unit, our Bluetooth unit, IRV technologies. This is going to control the music within the unit, kind of our multimedia center. Uh, very easy to navigate. I find most people don't have problems with this stuff these days. One thing to note is you do have zones one and two. What that is gonna be is the front and rear. Zone one being the front of the camper, zone two being the rear, uh, controlling volume separate of the two. And then most of that stuff, I don't think you're gonna have a problem working around. Here we have your awning controls, extend and retract. Now this is a momentary switch. Uh, as opposed to a one touch switch. So when you release the button, it's going to stop that awning in its place. Now you also have a couple wind sets here. Uh, difference between one and two is one of them will be more sensitive than the other. Uh, making sure we're gonna consult our manual to uh, figure out which one is going to be the more sensitive option. Now, these wind protection modes are awesome. They will really get you out of a bind if you need to but it's not necessarily something that I would kind of bet my lunch on. Uh, still, same rules apply as with any awning. You're never gonna wanna leave it uh, unattended, extended. Uh, if you do have any chance of like a freak windstorm or something like that, making sure you're, you're go ahead and put that in. Uh, save yourself a lot of money in the long run. And then up here we have our main light uh, cluster or switch cluster. Uh, porch lights are going to be the ones here to the left of the entry door. Uh, we then have our front accent lights, which are just those cool blue lights there above the front window. Our dinette lights are going to be the back lighting here uh, above that front window on the interior. Cabinet lights are going to be the blue lights uh, behind the shelving in the cabinets. And then our main light switch is of course going to be the overhead ceiling lights. And then separate of that cluster, we have our awning light switch. Uh, just like the name implies, that's going to go ahead and turn those lights on and off on that awning tube. Uh, moving on, we have our fire extinguisher down here, very important piece of safety equipment. Uh, we do wanna go ahead and inspect and test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, what you're gonna do is take note of the gauge here, make sure that fire extinguisher does still have pressure in it uh, before taking the unit out. In the event that you do have an emergency, uh, your equipment's good to go. And then in that same terms of safety equipment, we have a carbon monoxide LP leak detector above my head there. Uh, that does run on a nine volt battery. Uh, again, something we're gonna wanna test every single time we take the unit out and also not a bad idea to keep a spare nine volt battery with you in the event that you need to change that out on the road. Here in the dinette, you're going to find your kitchen accent light. Uh, that is just the backlighting there in the kitchen. And then we have our max X fan controls. Now I do believe here in the production model that this was moved over by the door. And what this is gonna allow you to do is open and close your vent fan and control speed, things like that. And then as we move here behind me, uh, we have the pull down privacy. Uh, of course, that doesn't really do much when you have the front cover over the window, but if you have that off and you're uh, enjoying the sunlight and the view during the day. Of course, as night falls, you'll wanna go ahead and pull that down. And then up top here, we have the, the overhead storage. Now you can see the cabinet releases here. That's one thing they're doing with the Terra is actually 
uh, having them locked down and some of the other models, they are just kind of like a friction fit. Uh, all of the, the drawers, the cabinetry, all of that is going to be soft close, uh, which is again, a nice feature. Uh, other than that, we're going to go ahead and talk about how to make this into a uh, sleeping area. So, uh, with that in mind, you're going to have a turn knob here on the underside of the table. That's going to keep this tabletop in place. So we're going to go ahead and loosen that up. And once we've done so, that whole table should come off of there. And then we're gonna go ahead and remove the pedestal part of the table. There's a little push button release here. So if you go ahead and push that down, that will allow you to go ahead and unscrew here. And then you're going to find this smaller leg, which uh, is again, the same style as what you had, just smaller. And then we go ahead and insert that here into the flange. Now this is kind of like a ratchet lock. So don't go overly tight with it or it's gonna be kind of in a bind. So just snug is fine on that. Once we get that short leg into place, we're then going to take our tabletop, set it here on the flange and then put the cushions on top of that. And you'll see that in a flash. There you have it. Uh, one thing I do like about this setup, uh, which was a cool thought by Intech, is that they have included straps on the underside of this uh, cushion and the idea being is you can go ahead and strap that uh, underneath the table that way this isn't like moving around all uh, moving around on you while you're trying to sleep at night in the kitchen area here starting out with the sink we have this nice uh, open farmhouse style sink uh, different spray levels or spray options on the sprayer and then of course you have that pull down option as well uh, moving over here, of course, we have that Dometic cooktop that we see in most other Intex. Uh, this is going to have that electric igniter. Idea being here, you turn to light on the dial and push the electric igniter, and you can easily go ahead and light those burners up. Now, if you've just prepped a meal here on the cooktop, it's worth noting that you want to make sure that you allow this cast iron grate to cool down uh, before closing the lid. Now, when you close the lid here, you're going to see some instructions up top here. You do need to lift up from both sides and that's going to go ahead and unlock that uh, and allow that to close. Here we have your high point convection oven. This is pretty cool. This is the first time I've actually seen this, uh, you know, super large on the inside, generally bigger than any RV style oven that I've ever seen or any convection that I've ever seen included in these units. Uh, very easy to kind of use. You have your options up here on the left, uh, preset options, frozen foods, auto defrost, kind of uh, different food options like you would see on a traditional style microwave. And then we have our kind of uh, mode buttons here, broil, high, low, convection, preheat, power level, things like that. And then time and temperature over here. So uh, very kind of close in operation to a microwave. Uh, but of course you can see you have the convection here on the inside, the heating element here on the top. A uh, really cool appliance. And again, this is the first that I've ever seen it. So it's an excellent uh, addition from Intech. Right up here above the hood vent, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, everything here on the left side is going to be a 110 volt appliance. Everything here on the right side uh, is a 12 volt appliance. Now they are labeled on the door. I know that you cannot see that, um, but they are, they are labeled there. Um, not a bad idea to, to keep a variety pack of fuses uh, with the unit in the event that uh, they would need to be replaced while you are out there uh, camping. And then right beside that, we have a battery disconnect switch. Uh, what you're going to use that for is periods of long-term storage with any 12 volt system. You're going to have uh, low, you know, phantom draws, uh, things running in the background. What this does is that completely isolates that uh, battery from the 12 volt system. The idea being is that you can go ahead and put the unit in storage and uh, it would be relatively in the same condition when you went to bring it out of storage. And then below that we have your command control. Uh, this is going to allow you to turn on and off most of your appliances, your tank heaters in your uh, water pump, things like that. And then it's also going to tell us how full our battery is. Now your battery is going to read full anytime you're plugged into shore power. To get a true readout of where your battery sits, you do need to unplug and then test from this location. 
Also going to uh, let you know where your fresh black and gray water tanks are in level of full. We mentioned on the outside that you are going to keep those valves in the closed position. You're going to monitor the tank levels. You'll do that from this location. And then down below that we have first up is going to be your water pump switch. We've talked about how that is designed to pressurize that freshwater holding tank and draw that water up from the uh, tank to the fixtures. And then we have a tank heater. We also have a line heater. Of course, those are designed for cold weather camping to keep your lines and your uh, holding tanks from freezing. And then beside that, we have our water heater sources. So gas and electric. And again, like we've mentioned on the exterior of the unit, you can use both at the same time or you can use them individually as those sources present themselves. This is going to be your Norcold 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. So we're seeing this kind of trend with the industry as a whole. Uh, a lot of units are moving uh, away from those three way or those propane driven refrigerators. Uh, moving into this compressor style 12 volt refrigerator still offers you the same versatility in terms of being on or off grid. Uh, Norcold does a great job of presenting that to us here. Uh, uh, when we look here on the inside, of course, not too terribly much that's going to differentiate this from any other uh, refrigerator that you may have seen or used. Uh, but we have our controls up top here. And what you're going to find here is uh, right in the middle, we have two uh, options there. And something that you can't generally do on an RV style refrigerator is have different temperature for refrigerator and freezer is just generally how the ammonia absorption systems work. Uh, the Norcold system that we have here will allow you to set a separate temperature for the freezer and the refrigerator. We then have our uh, actual controls up or down on there uh, to actually change the number one through five, I believe on this particular unit. And then we have our on off switch here. Uh, just really good to have that uh, controllability over the fridge and the freezer. Across from the kitchen here, uh, just some storage options that you have. Um, you know, pull out shelves top and bottom with that soft close. Uh, same up here, just a couple soft close um, drawers. You see a couple TV remotes here in the left side. Uh, moving up here, uh, we're gonna find another 12 volt charging station, a couple USBs as well as a cigarette lighter style receptacle, uh, a couple 110 volt outlets as well. Of course, your TV here, which is going to be a 110 volt appliance. If we go ahead and position that out of the way as best we can, we're going to see our antenna booster here. Now up on the roof, you're going to find a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. Uh, the idea being as long as you see this red light on and you do a channel search with your television, if there is any over the air programming available, it's going to automatically seek out the best signal. Uh, and, and bring you programming dependent on that. Now, if you're utilizing the uh, TV inlets that we've seen on the exterior of the unit, you do need to have that in the off position to allow that cable or satellite signal to bleed through the line. The way that Intec has done it here on the Oasis is they have actually separated the bathroom from the shower. Uh, you have your bathroom light switch here, which is cool. They have these nice little features here with the backlighting on the mirror, which is something that I think is pretty cool. Um, you know, kind of the usual suspects here, a small hand wash and sink, which is cool. It, you know, it's, it's good that it's there. You don't have to wash your hands in the, in the kitchen sink like some campers. And then turn it around here. I mean, we're seeing kind of the usual suspects that we've seen throughout the camper with the pull down shades. Uh, the uh, light up ring around the fan is a nice touch. Um, you have a standard RV style crank up um, vent fan here uh, to help, um, you know, vent the area, suck out any smells, anything like that. Um, cabinetry here, again, they're going to utilize that soft close cabinetry. And then you have your Dometic porcelain bowl uh, toilet down below. Uh, now it's going to be a pedal style flush, light press to fill up the toilet, uh, full press to flush. Keep in mind that any chemical treatments that we're using, uh, deodorizers, tank sensor cleaners, uh, you know, tissue dissolver, any of that stuff is going to be introduced here at the commode. So uh, be sure that we are following the manufacturer's recommendation. Also keep in mind that not only with this camper, but with any camper, it's very important that we do use a single ply RV grade toilet paper. 
and don't be afraid to take a nice long flush uh, it's our goal to feed as much water into that black water holding tank as we can to help uh, dissolve that body waste and toilet paper so now we'll see you on the shower side generally what you're going to find in here is is you know nothing ter too terribly much to talk about so we have that same vent fan that we saw in the toilet portion of the bathroom uh, crank up one thing i didn't mention when we were over there is, is this goes with any of your uh, overhead vent fans is do yourself a favor make sure they are closed before going down the road make sure they're snug uh, that way they're still there when you get to where you're going um, you know a lot of people have made that mistake so um, you know make sure you close them uh, other than that uh, light switch here down on the wall uh, adjustable shower head as well um, and then we have that standard on off here on the shower head. What that's going to allow you to do is conserve water consumption. Um, you know, if you're doing any boondocking, things like that, drawing out of the tank uh, or just, you know, with a lower capacity hot water heater, it's always a good idea when you're camping to do like a military Navy style shower. All right, here in the bedroom, um, you know, just to point out further some things that we've already talked about. Uh, the cabinetry here, uh, again, you're looking at that soft close uh, cabinetry throughout the unit. Um, either side of the bed is going to not only have a 12 volt uh, charging section that's going to utilize two USBs and one cigarette lighter style receptacle, but you also have 15 amp outlets on both sides of the bed as well. A secondary bedroom light switch is going to be on uh, that, the, that side of the bed. Uh, and the front wall as well. Uh, it's, again, just, just a great thought process by Intech that uh, a lot of people don't want to get out of bed to turn the lights off. So it's nice to have that switch uh, right by the bed there. Again, that same kind of pull down uh, privacy shade uh, that we've seen throughout the camper. Um, moving on, making sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, closet space is going to be here on this side of the wall. Uh, you have the the kind of coat hanger and then if we were to look up we would see an actual place to put some hangers things like that uh, not a huge closet but it is nice to have uh, it nonetheless and then um, moving forward still we have our captive touch dometic thermostat here this is going to control both the air conditioner and the furnace so we hit that mode button one time that's going to take us into fan speed. Now we have to choose a fan speed before we can carry on. And keep in mind, this is talking about air conditioner fan speed. Uh, your choices are low and high, uh, low, high, and auto. Uh, if you choose either low or high, then that fan is going to be, the fan will continue to run no matter what we essentially sh uh, set the thermostat to. So uh, for best, most scenarios, auto is going to be your best bet. Once we confirm that, that's gonna take us right into the air conditioner mode. We can see that it is set at 55 degrees. Our fan speed is auto and we are in air conditioner mode. We can hear that fan kick on uh, and start to run. Now, if I hit this one more time, that's going to take us there into the furnace mode. Um, once it realizes what we're doing, as long again as we are in that auto mode, it's going to kick down that uh, air conditioner fan uh, it's going to kick on the blower motor of the furnace uh, generally very soon after that. Uh, about 16 seconds that actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Now, something may happen within the first 15 minutes of operation if that furnace were to set off your smoke alarm. Uh, keep in mind that that's totally acceptable from the appliance manufacturer. Uh, it's just the way that they kind of are, they, they don't run as efficient as they will uh, within that first 15 minutes of operation. There's sometimes dust, road debris, things like that, that are being burnt off. So it's kind of like lighting your furnace at the first cold day of the year, every single time you light the furnace in this thing. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if we hit that mode button one more time, it's going to shut the unit off um, and take us into that off mode. Now that furnace generally will, will keep running for about two minutes after the fact as it's blowing off excess heat and things like that. And then down below that we have our max air fan control. We've seen that in the kitchen area. This is again just going to control the overhead fan. It's going to give you four fan speeds. You can open and close the vent here on this location or you can go ahead and turn that fan off. Now uh, below that we have another switch cluster. 
Our main lights are going to be the other lights throughout the camper other than the bedroom. So every other overhead light and then our cabinet lights, which are going to be the blue lights here just in the bedroom and then our bedroom lights here. So you can either turn the overhead lights on when you're coming in the door or you can turn them off from laying in bed. So here under the bed in this uh, totally convenient, not awkward place at all, uh, you're going to find your freshwater tank drain, your winterization inlet valve, things like that. So uh, the valve here on the left of this shot is going to be how you drain your freshwater holding tank. Of course, you can see it in the closed position now. Uh, you are just going to open it up and that is a gravity drain. Also down in that area, um, and I, we were just joking, it is kind of weird that it's all the way back here in the bed. As mentioned, this is prototype number one. This is, this is something that they've reworked. So um, most of you out there are not going to have to deal with this, but um, you know, it is still very, very much usable. Uh, one thing you are going to find while down there uh, is going to be the vacuum inlet for your winterization process. Uh, the idea being is that you would um, follow this hose down to the nearest valve. You're going to go ahead and open up that valve. Uh, keep in mind, once you have drained all of the water from the unit, we then bypass our water heater, and then we are going to introduce antifreeze into the system using this vacuum line. So follow it down, open up the valve, remove the plug here in the end, stick that into your bottle of antifreeze. Uh, then you go around the unit from water fixture to water fixture, opening up both the hot side and cold side of each fixture. Once you see that pink antifreeze at the fixture, you are fully winterized. All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed that walkthrough here on the Terra Oasis. Um, lot to talk about, a lot of things that we went through, but if we did miss anything, if you have any questions on um, you know, the differences between the prototype that we reviewed today or the production model, uh, comment below. If you have any other questions or concerns, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Don't put your head in there. <laughs>